Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today on World Kidney Day. We have Ms. Joanne Mitchell McLaren joining us with GSK's SM Lupus and she will discuss lupus nephritis. Ms. Joanne. Good afternoon and thank you and welcome, welcome, welcome in. And so today we just truly want to talk about lupus nephritis in relationship to your lupus. And so what I want to say to you is that um, nothing we discuss here today um, uh, trumps anything that your provider advice uh, or what they will, your treatment we are here really, this is an informative issue and just wanted to empower you with knowledge because knowledge is power and to help equip you with things so that you're able to actually go in and talk. So as uh, Adrian said, I am Joanne Mitchell McLaren and I am a nurse practitioner um, I have, of more than 25 years. I work for GSK as a patient engagement liaison. And so my job is as an advocate. So I go out, educate the community. We educate through um, the advocacy groups and we really you know, encourage patients to take our information and then go in better equipped to partner with your physicians. So there are some slides that I'm gonna be skipping over which cover kind of lupus in the beginning. Um, but I really want to focus on the lupus nephritis aspect. So we all know lupus is an autoimmune disease. There's no cure. You treat the signs and symptoms, and it's generally characterized by flares and remissions and periods you may have that you may feel great, and there's periods where you just might feel lousy. So I'm just going over a few highlighted things, all right? And then um, talking about physical symptoms, right? Some are visible on the outside of the body. And what are those things? And the reason I'm just starting here is so that when we get to the invisible things, it kind of brings things together for you. So when we think about physical symptoms of lupus, we know that there can be significant weight changes, right? And for many women, and there are men who have lupus, but for women, I always say your hair is your crown. So you may notice there's times when your hair is actually falling out. You may notice that you have some joint swelling and that's an arthritic condition. It's just so painful. Um, you may notice that you have a butterfly rash that occurs on your face. And then there may be the copious mouth and nose sores that are painful. And while these are not all the symptoms of lupus, they are the most common ones that we see. Now, some of the invisible signs and symptoms that happen in the inside of the body. And I'm going to try to shift this because it is in my way. All right. So what are those things? And here we want to talk about the inflammation in the kidneys. And this, you know, your lupus, because you have lupus, these are organ damages that occur that you cannot see. And you can have blood and or protein in your urine. So probably when you go to the doctors, they oftentimes will do a urinalysis. And these are the things they're looking for. And then there's inflammation or swelling in your heart or your lungs. And these things may actually cause chest pain. There are times when you are, have fatigue. So it's just abnormal tiredness, right? Throughout the entire body without much effort on your part. And even when patients sleep eight hours, unfortunately, 80 to 90% of the people living with lupus experience some level of fatigue and they'll just say, I'm just tired. These are things that you really need to have discussions with your doctor about. And then of course, when we think about those invisible signs of lupus, there's the neurological effects. These things can include like headache and depression, seizure, stroke, or even neuropathy. Neuropathy is just simply that you have that tingling in both your hands and your feet. And then there's this brain fog that you oftentimes hear people talk about where you become easily confused or you may have some memory loss or an inability to just simply concentrate. In fact, 
Research has shown that 50 to 80% of the people living with lupus may experience brain fog, which can include memory, that concentration and attention. On a personal note, um, I run a health and wellness ministry through a church and we have a lady, her name is Sister Mary. She is a lupus warrior, right? She's 80 years old now, her last birthday. And she's been attending the church for 24 years, same location. And one day we had a meeting and we're waiting and waiting for Miss Mary to show up. She finally got there. She was flustered. And she said, I just couldn't remember how to get to the church. I got in my car. I started driving and I couldn't remember. And this happens, but you want to talk to your doctor about it just because it's a normal something that may occur. And not everyone will have this brain fog, but the longer you live with lupus, you may notice that you experience it. So today I just say to the audience, in your own way, like what signs and symptoms of lupus have you experienced, whether it was the external or have you had some internal things that are not visible to your loved ones or to your doctor? And just think about what things those may be. It's so important to make sure that you are documenting. Document everything in your journal. <laughs> and stick with me to the end because there's some important things that I'm going to actually ask you to do today. So keep your phone near you. All right, lupus nephritis. So here is why we're here today. What is lupus nephritis? It really is kidney disease that is caused by lupus. So in lupus nephritis, you get swelling and irritation that occurs actually in the kidneys. And in fact, 35% of newly diagnosed adult lupus patients can have clinical signs and symptoms and involvement. And we're going to talk about those in a few minutes. 40% of adult patients with lupus will develop lupus nephritis. So we're looking at almost half of all lupus patients will have some degree of lupus nephritis. And up to three-fourths of children with, SL, have, with SLE may develop kidney involvement. So treating your lupus nephritis early is absolutely critical. Who gets lupus nephritis? Well, among patients with SLE, lupus nephritis and lupus-related kidney disease are more common in African-American, Asians, and Hispanics. However, men are more likely to develop lupus nephritis than women. And remember what I said earlier, one in every 10 patients is a male. And some people forget that men actually are affected. And unfortunately, on the lupus nephritis side, as I said, men are more likely than women to actually be diagnosed. Now, we want to look at the role of the kidney so that we understand the complexities that happen when we actually have on lupus nephritis. So what do the kidneys do? Well, number one, they remove waste and extra fluid from the body. Very important. They help control blood pressure. So let's just say that you already have hypertension, high blood pressure, and you suddenly, your blood pressure, you note it because you take your blood pressure regularly, which you should do. Um, you notice that you're up 20 points. That's something to bring to the attention of your provider. And the kidneys also help to create new red blood cells. When you have those red blood cells, you breathe a whole lot easier. It brings that fresh oxygenation, right? And then it helps to keep bones healthy and strong. It also helps, the, the kidneys help to maintain the right pH balance in the blood through a balance of chemicals. So it's usually helping so that you're not too acidic and that it's not too alkaline, but it creates a perfect balance um, within the blood system. Now, what happens to the kidneys in lupus nephritis? Well, 
As I mentioned earlier, you can get scarring in the kidneys, which could make them unable to function properly. And many of the signs and symptoms are here. So you can get swelling in your feet, your ankles, your legs, your hands, and even around your eyes, you may notice that you have significant puffiness. You can have higher blood pressure. This says high blood pressure. But if you've already had hypertension, and then you notice you're getting 20, 30 points added on, this is a sign. Blood in your urine. So I encourage every lupus patient, when you go to the bathroom, turn around and look to see, is it clear or does it look like there is blood there? And then another sign, foamy or frothy urine. Um, it is undescribable. It, it looks very foam-like in the toilet. So you want to make sure you're taking a look. And then if you have an increased need for urination, especially at night, if you know, look, I get up once a night and suddenly you're getting up three times, four times a night, that could be a indication that you have a lupus nephritis onset, right? Then there are classes of lupus nephritis. And the way in which lupus nephritis progresses can be thought of in classes or stages. So you can have class one all the way down to class six. Class one obviously is the one that is less severe and class six is very severe. So the classes you know, are based on you having a kidney biopsy. So usually along with your rheumatologist that you see, every single patient who has lupus should make sure they have a nephrologist on board. Even if your rheumatologist says to you, oh, you're fine, you don't need a nephrologist. No, you are in a partnership with your physician. It is imperative that you have a nephrologist on board. I don't care what they say and talk to your doctor to understand more about the classes and the kidney biopsy procedure. So if you learn, hey, I think you may have class two or even more, you know, I think there's some kidney involvement going on, there is a biopsy because that is how lupus nephritis is diagnosed. You clearly need a biopsy. It is not just simply by a blood test or a urinary test. And you wanna know the facts, right? So take ownership of your lupus lifestyle. Untreated lupus nephritis can lead to severe scars in the kidneys and serious kidney damage. In fact, approximately 20% of patients with lupus nephritis will progress to dialysis treatment and or in need of a kidney transplant within 10 years of their diagnosis. And I always preface by saying here that a kidney loss today is a kidney loss forever. Kidney transplants are difficult. Um, there's not a bank of kidneys just simply lying around. So you wanna take and be proactive with your care when it comes to your kidneys so that you know what you can maintain and keep your own kidneys as long as you can, but that requires that you do a few things. Now, this is just a real lupus warrior, and you may be newly diagnosed, or perhaps you are a lupus warrior. This is someone who visited our Us in Lupus site through GSK. It says, I was diagnosed with lupus in 2015. I have SLE and stage two kidney disease. You know your body better than anyone. So pay attention to what triggers your flares and keep your appointments and educate yourself. I think this is so powerful. This individual was diagnosed not only with lupus at the time, but she was already in stage two kidney disease. That's why it's imperative that you pay attention. Now, if you haven't, this is a question that I'm putting out there, not that I expect you to answer in the chat. However, have you discussed lupus nephritis with your doctor? And if you haven't, I encourage you today to do so. Whether you're a lupus warrior 
or whether you just recently were diagnosed, you want to make sure that you let them know that you're aware that your kidneys, you can have long-term organ damage with those kidneys. And so you want to see a nephrologist. You have every right as a patient to see a nephrologist. So I encourage everyone to seek that avenue. Now, if there's any questions that you have at this time about anything I've covered, there's a chat function there. You can certainly put it in the chat and I would be happy to respond. So I'm gonna give a second. If I don't see any questions, then I will certainly um, continue to move forward with our discussion. All right, it looks like we are clear, but if anyone has anything as we progress, we would be happy to take those questions. So your lifestyle, ways to manage lupus as part of your daily life. So what kind of things can you do so that you're more informed and you're very much an intricate part of your care? You want to monitor your symptoms. And here I talk a lot about journaling. Write down because you're not going to remember when you go to that doctor's, maybe your appointment is a week out or so. So you want to monitor your symptoms and you definitely want to get the right nutrition. And I'll give you a little more specifics on that in a second. Take time to self-reflect. You know what? Sit back, you know, maybe have your cup of tea or your cup of coffee or whatever it is. And you know what? Take time for you um, to, because this is your journey. And then you want to communicate openly, not only with your doctors, but you also want to make sure that you're communicating with your loved ones, your support group. Tell them what you're going through, what you're experiencing. Make sure you don't miss your appointments with your doctors, your rheumatologist, your nephrologist, your dermatologist. Get tests and treatment as prescribed by your physician and talk to specialists. I say everyone should have a nephrologist. And if you're having, you know, these flares and you're having the rashes, you want to make sure that you're talking to a, der a dermatologist and keep yourself informed. The more informed you are, the better you can advocate for yourself. When I talk about monitoring your symptoms, keep in mind every symptom matters. You may not know that at first, which symptoms you feel are a result of the lupus, but all symptoms matter. Write them down, put them in a journal, a notebook. Be proactive. Any symptom of lupus is the result of some form of inflammation in the body, which may over time lead to permanent organ damage. And then keep track. Make note of your symptoms in a way that works for your calendar or your health journal or an app on your phone. And when you go to that doctor, you can say, listen, I experienced this on this day. After I ate this, I had this. Or if I had a stressful day at, on the job, um, I had this flare up. You want to make sure that you're ready because their time is so limited. But if you go in prepared, the better you'll be. Journaling for lupus nephritis. So whether you're really concerned about your kidney function or you've already been diagnosed, monitoring your symptoms is equally important. So keep note of how much water you're consuming. Are you having 64 fluid ounces or are you only drinking eight ounces a day? Is your urine, know the color, is it dark yellow? Is it light yellow? Is it foamy? Is it frothy? You want to know that. And take your blood pressure. If you don't have a cuff, get one. One of the self, you know, uh, automatic things that you can wrap and just it press a button and it monitors. Check for areas of unexplained swelling. If you've got in your hands and your feet, around your eyes and make note of rapid weight changes. I encourage you, if you don't have a scale, get one because if you put on 10 pounds overnight, you know that something is wrong, right? And if you notice any changes, always speak to your doctor. You should be your biggest advocate. Be proactive about monitoring your symptoms so that you can better manage your condition. 
And no one knows you better than you. You're with you 24 seven. If you don't keep a journal, this would be a good time to start, right? So when you get the right nutrition, and I talked about that on the other page, you know, having the right food, keep track of your meals and snacks and a health journal. Talk to your doctor about what foods you should avoid and what foods you may want to limit. So we're going to look at a few of those. When you're looking at lupus nephritis, if there is some sort of uh, kidney involvement, your doctor may say, listen, low sodium diet is best. Why? Cutting back on salt can really help do two things, lower the blood pressure and reduce how much water that your body stores. A low protein diet may also lighten the burden on the kidneys because you know our kidneys are responsible for breaking down everything that we consume. And then they may say, hey, you need a renal diet. This means you have to limit the intake of not only sodium, but phosphorus and protein in the diet as well. And here is where I would encourage you to have a nutritionist bought on board. You are entitled to a nutritionist. This is somebody who is licensed and knows what to tell you, you know, and help you to even develop menus around the things that you enjoy. So a nutritionist is someone. Again, another lupus warrior who visited our site said, keep a log of your symptoms. Watch what you eat and drink. Where there is a symptom, be sure to log what you've eaten so that you can track your flares. Obviously, if you began consuming things and every time you have that, you end up with a flare, that's something that you're going to want to avoid in the future. Take some time for yourself. This is awesome and imperative. Reflect on your own experience. Your journey is different from someone else's, right? And how is lupus really impacting your daily life? And how is lupus impacting the life of your children, if you have children? your husband, and those around you who love you? And what areas of your body concern you the most? As I said, for me, my hair is my crown. And I did experience some major hair fallout about 20 years ago. Didn't know what it was. Come to find out it wasn't lupus, it was stress. So I've learned how to manage that because as a woman, your hair is your crown. And even as a man, his hair, hey, He's a king. He wants his hair, right? Do you have any concerns about organ complication? Use these questions as part for a journal entry or to get a conversation started with your doctor, right? Imperative. And communicate openly with your healthcare team. So if you're concerned about lupus affecting the kidneys, ask your doctor questions. Ask the nurse when you go in. Um, can I make any changes to my diet to help my kidneys function better? What steps can I take to monitor my kidney function? All of these things you want to make sure you're bringing to their attention. Now, and stay up to date on tests, right? You go in and now everybody is linked in to either my chart or some form uh, that you can go online and pull your own labs. Yes, the systems are connected now, so you expect them to be able to click in if you go here for a specialist or there for a specialist, but I always encourage patients to actually go ahead, print out your stuff so that you have it in the event the doctor hasn't been able to pull it up, right? So that they know, you know, you had a urine test done and they're going to check you for protein. Uh, they know what your recent blood work shown. Um, they're going to check kidney function, and they may even do a kidney biopsy to check scarring or for inflammation. But you want to make sure if the more information you have at your visits, the better prepared you are, and it equips you to have a better conversation with your doctor. Now, I mentioned this not once, not twice, probably multiple times. Your doctor may refer you to a specialist for a particular consultation or treatment, Right. Gonna everyone, every lupus patient has a rheumatologist. You also have a primary care physician, but that nephrologist, 
you need a dermatologist, a cardiologist. And if you get inflammation that is causing you to have difficulties in breathing, you need a pulmonologist. And then get a nutritionist. If you're trying to figure out what things you can have, what things have too much phosphorus in it, what is too high in protein, get yourself a nutritionist who can help you build a menu to talk about what diet is best for you. And get the right treatment. Your treatment plan is personalized for you. And even if your sister has lupus, all, every patient is different. You and your doctor can decide on a treatment plan. But those treatment plans include so many different classifications of medications. You can have anti-inflammatories. You can have corticosteroids, immunomodulators, diuretics, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, biologics, immunosuppressants. There are a variety of things that you can use to treat your disease, but it needs to fit your lifestyle. For years, I practiced in a hospital and writing prescriptions for patients. I might think in my head, you can take a medicine that's four times a day, but because of your lifestyle, maybe you can't. So it's not up to your physician to just automatically assume, and that's the assumption many doctors will make, and nurse practitioners, PAs alike, but it should fit your lifestyle and we should build a plan around you. That's where your collaboration starts. So as you manage, and we're getting close to the end, I stay informed, continue to learn about lupus. You can research symptoms, treatment options, and potential complications like lupus nephritis through a number of different channels. And on the screen, if you have a phone in front of you and you just want us to take a quick snippet of this, you have lupus.org, you have the rheumatology.org and kidney.org. And here you'll find tips and tools on how to manage your life with lupus, imperative. Now I said I wanted you to see, uh, so if you have your phone handy, I would encourage you to get your phone and you know what, bring up your camera. And on that camera, take a screenshot. Now, there are so many things that, you know, you have understand the basics of lupus, identify common lupus symptoms, register for a symptom tracking kit, or to learn more about lupus. I highly recommend that everyone uh, screenshot the QR code here for registering for symptom tracker kit. And then that way you get this, it's something to kind of help you to navigate as you go through your journey. Um, and then you can then use that tracker kit when you're going into appointment, you can have a conversation. So I'm gonna give you a moment to take the QR code, put your cameras up, and then when you see it light up, it'll say tap here, you can tap there and then of course, it'll take you to a site where you can get great information. So I'm going to give you a couple of seconds in case you're screenshotting more than one. Um, but it is imperative that you have the greater information you have, the more empowered you are. And knowledge is power. And there's no greater advocate than you. Sometimes patients say, well, I don't know how to have this conversation or I'm not comfortable. This is your life and you are the patient. So it's not a dictatorship when you go to the doctors, it is a partnership. And if your doctor doesn't want a partner, maybe you need to find another one. Um, but it is a partnership. And I, I know personally, I always enjoyed when patients came in, they had things written down. That way I can focus strategically on exactly what is most important for them. So today I encourage each of you to be your biggest advocate and reach out. 